everybody thanks for watching now this series on ancient history is really going to get into the biblical transition of you know real proven history into the Bible you know into what people believe is actual history today so basically when you look at the Bible and you read about all the stories you read about the wars of the Israelites or what have you you have to understand as I stated before this stuff is from proven history this is why you get the um the hebrews and some of the christians saying well you know black history is in the bible the bible is all true it's proven da 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 but you have to understand just like they plagiarized from kemet they took real history real proven history and plagiarized it and just you know changed it around to fit the bible but just like i say to the hebrews and to the christians you know nobody else wrote about those civilizations nobody else wrote about the Hebrews. We should find in different civilizations around the world, you know, um, what uh, these people did. Other people should have spoke about them and what have you. We don't find that. But we do find that as it pertains to what I'm going to talk about in this video. So, you know, I want to first of all, thank you guys, of course, for taking the time to purchase or download, you know, the DVD and uh, for supporting, of course. But this is like really important right here. We're going to really get into this series because this is going to really bridge a big gap that you're going to have, a big void, because there's a lot of stuff in history. And as you have seen with Buddhism or what have you, I'm going through history and trying to connect the pieces. You're going to get a huge connection after this first DVD in this series. But you can see where it's a lot of stuff in history that's missing. A lot of pieces, a lot of things don't fit. A lot of things are not clarified, you know, in the Bible when you're reading them. So when you understand how these things uh, fits to actual world proven history, you can see what it's trying to tell you. When I talk about the code, when I'm talking about the code in the book, these are what I'm talking about. Because in these stories that we can go back and look to actual real history, you can see where it fits and what the story is actually trying to tell you and reveal to you about the powers that be, about their agenda, and about what's going on. It's all laid out. It's deep. It's deep. And we're going to go through this and really get into, you know, the Phoenicians and Babylonians. And, you know, right around that time, what I talked about what happened to Kemet, because this is where it begins. This is why it seems like uh, everything goes back to Kemet, because this is where it really starts. It's a bunch of history before that. But as far as what we have been seeing from the powers that be, this is where it begins. So when we get into all this stuff, you're going to be able to break it down. You're going to be able to see where stuff fits and how it pertains to the Bible and actual history. So we're going to begin with, you know, Genesis, the garden. So the Garden of Eden story. I always like to go to the garden. As I said, it's a lot of hidden stories, a lot of hidden things wrapped up into those stories. But in this case, you have to ask yourself what is missing from Genesis. When you think about the Genesis story, you get the creation of heavens and earth and, you know, planets or what have you. But what is missing and what's missing is the war, you know, the fall of Satan. What exactly happened? Why is that story missing from Genesis? It should be there. It's the reason why we found it in Ezekiel and Isaiah. And it's, you know, so far from the Genesis story. This is supposed to have happened before Adam and Eve, but it should be there. But this also, this also tells you that there is a gap. There's a time gap. There's a lot of time missing. If God created the heavens and the earth and, you know, all of a sudden we get man, we get Adam and Eve, there is some time missing. You know, what's going on? Then all of a sudden, you know, Satan shows up in the garden. That's a lot of time missing. And it's a reason why, you know, they put it that way. So when you get to Ezekiel and you start reading about uh, the story in Ezekiel 28, uh, you start reading from 1 to 13, we'll go to, well, as a matter of fact, we'll go from 11 to 13, keep it kind of short. But when you start reading in uh, uh, Ezekiel 13, 1, it's talking about, you know, he's talking to Tyre, to the king of uh, Tyre. As a matter of fact, he's talking to the prince. That's another thing you got to understand translations uh, in a lot of the versions. In some translation, it translates into prince in most of them, but in some it translates into king, you know, or what have you. So, you know, just be mindful of that. It don't matter in any case, but just understand. 
that he could possibly be talking to the king in the beginning and the king, you know, when to speak into um, to Satan. So you'll understand in a second. But it starts out with uh, Ezekiel basically speaking to the prince of Tyre or Tyrus. Understand Tyre is Tyrus. Same thing. Get into that. And he's talking to him and basically telling him that God is condemning him for basically, uh, you know, claiming to be a God. So he's basically condemning the prince of Tyre, a Tyrus, for claiming to be a god. And then as you go on, you realize that, you know, he's starting to talk to the king of Tyrus. And basically what he's, what he's explaining to the king, you know, fits the story of Satan. This is one of the things you got to understand. When you start getting into the story of Satan, it's confusing. It's confusing. And you'll see in a second. So we read here, Ezekiel uh, 28, 11 through 13. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up lamentations upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou seedest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Think about that. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, which tabrets all these things are right here, and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So it starts out with him speaking to the king of Tyrus. So clearly in what he's saying, cannot pertain to him, but it's talking to him. But we know for damn well, this man wasn't in the Garden of Eden. We know that this human man can't have, you know, these jewels built into his being. So we understand this verse is to be talking about Satan. A lot of scholars are in disagreement on the verses and what it actually means. Some people think that, you know, it's, you know, him trying to basically compare what the king of Tyrus is doing to what Satan did. That doesn't fit. A lot of scholars believe that the king of Tyrus was possessed by Satan, which makes a lot more sense. But when you read it, they seem to be coupling Satan with this man. Think about that. Why are they making a comparison? Why is it coupling Satan with this man? It's not being definitive and saying what's exactly going on. It's just dude possessed by Satan. Are you talking about Satan? Which clearly he has to be. Who else was in the garden? Nobody else but Adam, Eve, the serpent, God. Definitely wasn't this dude. So what's going on? But we see this coupling of this story of Satan with the man. We see it again in Isaiah. So we read Isaiah 14, 12 through 16 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nation? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Did you pick up on that? It said, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that basically brought down the kingdoms. Is this the man? See, a lot of people want to think about Satan. We hear him referred to as, you know, the serpent, the dragon, the beast, you know, Lord of the things that fly, Lord of the air, what have you. A lot of people don't conceive man because when you say the word man, you think of man, mortal, mortal man. So how could this man be Satan? How could Satan be a man? Satan's supposed to be an angel, Lucifer, the light bringer, what have you. So when you look at the verse, it's clearly saying, is this the man? So when scholars look at this, they say, well, we can't be talking about, you know, Satan. Satan's not man. I mean, it's clearly saying the man here. That word is not a misinterpretation in the, uh, the ancient manuscripts. It says man. So what is it talking about? Again, coupling Lucifer, Satan, with man. What's going on? Why is it making this comparison? And you would have to stop and think if Satan is not a man. If he is to bring down the nations, the only way he can do it is if he get mad to do it. 
if he possess a man or you know influence man to do it any way you want to slice it it has to be a man that's going to actually you know bring down the nations it has to be men it has to be a man it can't be him so you have to really think about that but again it's coupling satan with man it's given a comparison of satan with man just like in ezekiel you have man and satan so think about that so you look at the genesis story we understand about satan being there but it's not giving us the story of Satan, you know, what happened, you know, how does he know what he know? You know, what is he doing in the garden? Doesn't get into all that. But then, as I said, we go to Ezekiel, we go to Isaiah and we see these stories that I just read about the sort of, you know, origin of Satan. But it's not 100 percent clear. It's not clear. Now, a lot of people do not understand that. A lot of people don't get that. You would think that somewhere in the Bible, even if you want to know people who don't read it, that there is this definitive story about what's going on uh, with Satan. A lot of people go to Revelations and get confused about the story, about the war. A lot of people get confused about what's going on and don't understand if it's talking about before or after. Is it talking about at the end? Or about the war in heaven. And when I say the war in heaven, I mean when it first went down. When Lucifer and his angels was cast down. But remember, it says in Jude that his angels was locked away in everlasting chains. So when you get into Revelations and you talk about this war, it really shouldn't be. Who was Satan supposed to be fighting with when his uh, angels were supposed to be locked away? You know, until judgment. So, you know, even then you would think, well, you know, if you got them locked away, why would you let them out to come and fight you? So they got to think about that. It's a lot of stuff you have to really deal with and get into, a, into the Bible. It's a lot of it. A lot of stuff you have to really, you know, mold your mind around. But in this case, the key here is Tyrus or Tyre. So you have to understand it's the same place to talk about the same thing. As you can see here, this is what it basically looked like on the map. We're going to deal a lot with this place. There's a lot of history wrapped up in here. It's unbelievable. And we're going to get into it. Let's read. The Phoenician city of Tyre, a rich history of industry, mythology, and conflict. According to tradition, the city of Tyre was founded in 2750 BC and is considered one of the world's oldest metropolises. Think about that. For much of its history, Tyre has played an important role in the region. The Tyrians were master seafarers and explorers. By sailing around the Mediterranean, the Tyrians made contact with other civilizations and founded colonies. As a result, Tyre had a special place in a number of ancient Mediterranean communities. Greek mythology states Europa, for whom the continent of Europe was named, hmm, you see where we're going, was a Phoenician princess of Tyre who was abducted by Zeus in the form of a bull and brought to the island of Crete. On the island, Zeus revealed his identity, and Europa became the first queen of Crete. One of Europa's brothers was Cadmus, who according to legend brought the alphabet to mainland Greece. In addition, the Tyrians also founded colonies, the most famous of which is Rome's greatest rival, Carthage. It is believed that this city was founded by another Tyrian princess, Dido, who left Tyre to escape her evil husband. It is said that when she arrived in North Africa, she requested a small piece of land from the Berber king, uh, Larbus, and subsequently founded Carthage. The story of Dido is most vividly portrayed in Virgil's Aeneid. So we're talking about Tyre or Tyrus, and you see how they do it. In the Bible, you got Tyrus, but it's really Tyre. Tyrus, Tyre, you know, when you see one of the names, it's talking about the same place, a city in uh, Phoenicia. Now, understand one, of course, uh, Phoenicia is basically, you know, modern day, today is Lebanon. But we understand this is where Europa comes from, which Europa gives us Europe. So again, you see where we are headed. We're talking about Europe. We're talking about the Europeans. Huge history going on here that we're going to get into. So understand one, of course, this land, you know, didn't belong to the Phoenicians. You got to understand what the Phoenicians is. This was clearly part of Egyptian territory. When you understand uh, the Egyptian kingdom, it was part of the Egyptian empire, that land for a long time. Don't let history fool you. We're going to get into this. 
but it was a part of Egyptian territory. Now, the name Phoenician was given to it, you know, by the Greeks. The Greeks is the one who named it uh, Phoenician or, uh, you know, the Phoenicians. And it comes from the Greek word uh, Phoenicus. So Phoenician comes from the Greek word Phoenicus, which means purple people. Phoenicus, purple people. So this is where we get Phoenician. What are the purple people? They call them purple people. One, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, we get so black, we can look purple. That's, that's not it. But um, <laughs> Phoenicus or uh, Phoenician, that purple people thing comes from the Morax. The Morax is basically a shellfish or like a sea slug kind of sort of. Basically, it emits this purple dye that is very strong. It doesn't just wash off or come off. So a lot of people, you know, wanted to use it because it actually got stronger in the sun. You know, so if you use that purple dye, it actually got stronger. So this is why they call them purple people, because the people who worked in there, you know, getting these shells out in the water, of course, the dye would cover them up and it would be like purple, you know, when it came out. So Phoenician comes from Phoenicus. And the Greeks are the one who came up with that name. So now most people, when they think about uh, the Phoenicians, when they think about that land, some people think about the Persians, think about Arabs, some people think about Europeans being there. A lot of people, when they think about uh, the Phoenicians, don't take it uh, back to black people. And this is one of the problems. It's a lot of debates when people start getting into ancient Phoenician. Who was the Phoenicians? Who was the Phoenicians? Was they black? Was they white? What have you? And you can understand why when you start going into that history, especially when you see the Greeks talk about in their mythology getting a language, which we'll get into that. But a lot of people don't, you know, associate it with African people or black people. But the land was clearly Egyptian territory, plain and simple. You go there and you have the uh, Temple of Obelis and Blablos. And you go to Blablos, you have the Temple of Obelis still stand to this day. We're talking dating over, you know, 1000 BCE. And the temple is still there. You can see it's all these obelisks, all these little you know statues or what have you there, as well as other Egyptian artifacts and Egyptian sites there as one of the tourist attractions when you go there. Now, you start going back over, you can see, you know, not too far away is Tyre, the city of Tyre. Not that far. You keep going over more, and guess what else you run into? You run into Israel. You keep going over, of course, more, and of course, Egypt. All of this was Egyptian territory, of course. They have all this land, all this space. There's going to be a lot of, you know, things that you research and see that's going to try to fit biblical history within there. Whenever you see that, keep reading because you need to know the bullshit. But it's bullshit, plain and simple. But this was Egyptian territory, the stuff that's there, which they won't dare get rid of because they make money off it. You know, as a tourist attraction, it's still there to prove who the area belonged to. Now, you have to think about something, you know, because... You have the Phoenician alphabet, you have Egyptian, and of course they're, you know, they're different. We're going to get into that as well. But you have to realize what the Phoenician territory was, what Tyre was, you know, what that area was. Since it's on that coast and you have the only other way that you can get in there, you know, if you're Greece or what have you and you're trying to come there, this is the place where you would have to land, you know, far as a ship. So if you're going to be doing trade, and, or anything with people in that area, like Syria, what have you, Lebanon, Israel, you need a closer port, which that port would be the closest port. So what the Egyptians did was they basically left that port open. They left Tyre basically open, that city, and that whole area up to Blabos. All that area was basically like an open seaport where you had so many different countries coming in there trading. They was trading, you know, they, was, they had a lot of merchants there. It was a lot of marketplaces. You know, they, you know, had goods that was bringing into other countries. This is what everybody talks about. It's well known. Tyre is well known. A lot of people talk about it. A lot of historians talk about it. But everybody know it as the people who was living there was like, you know, fishermen and real seafaring people who traveled out, who knew everybody. So it's even in, in the Bible. So when you read in Acts, Acts 21, 3, it says, now when we had discovered Cyprus, which we know Cyprus is right there, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria. Now, I don't know how the map was back then, but you can't sail into Syria, you know, easily today and landed in Tyre for there the ship was to unload her burden. 
in other verses it says unload her cargo so they just king james version you know kept it old school but it says to unload her cargo of course now as i said you're gonna read a lot of stuff you're gonna start reading stuff about the philistines and the hebrew israelites the, some kind of war and all this kind of drama going on it's bullshit all of this is there to give validity to the bible plain and simple we understand what happened in history this was egyptian land what happened we know who conquered that area was the persians so when you look at this little uh relief here what it say down here it says 500 bce or the fifth century bce excuse me of course we know in the fifth century this is around the time when you know the persians took that land so you see clearly one one when you just look at recorded history it all matches up that's just one of the things we're going to go through in this video and you're going to see recorded history matching up with the bible debunking the bible as i said there's no way you can read the book and if, if you read the book and you know history game plain and simple this is why they have to hide history why they have to distort it but that area clearly you know belonged to the egyptians now of course because you know phoenicia was an actual place you find a lot of artifacts around that area from the Phoenicians. You go into Spain, you find from the Phoenician period in Spain, artifacts in Spain. But of course, the Phoenician period was the Egyptian period because they were Egyptians. But you find artifacts pertaining to the Phoenicians throughout the area, the so-called Middle East. And we can find this stuff. This is how we know these people were real. They actually existed because this was a trading port and so many people was coming in and out and buying goods, Egyptian stuff as well. And we can find this stuff. This stuff exists. This is how we know. This is how when you do research in history, if we ain't finding it pertaining to the Hebrews, it's not, we, they didn't exist. It's not real. So when we look, we know the history. We know that, again, the Persians came in, conquered that Egyptian land, which Tyre was a part of the Egyptian uh, territory. They came and they took it. Then we know that the Greeks came and took it from the Persians. So now what I talked about in the video on YouTube about the uh, Hebrew Israelites, when I talked about, you know, the Bible, as far as the Bible using its stories, you know, the Bible, are trying, they're trying to basically justify the genocide and slavery of African people. This is what the Bible was talking about. We talked about that in those videos because the Bible was giving you all these stories about the conquest of these lands. And a lot of people don't realize, even though they hide them, you know, with names, with different names, that these lands are pertaining to African people. You know, the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and all that stuff like that. It's talking about African land that they took and said that God, you know, allowed them to take it. This is what it's pertaining to. So you got to understand one, the story. We know, again, Greeks came in there, took it from the Persians. So you got to understand one, Tyre was a huge city. You had Tyre and you had Tyre, the mainland. And you had Tyre, you see that part that sticks out in the water. It was an island, you know, unto itself for a while, for a long time. But you had, when the Greeks came in there, you know, Alexander, his troops basically slaughtered everybody on the mainland and they basically killed a bunch of people and they enslaved whoever they could enslave. A lot of people bought their way out of the whole situation. Some people couldn't, but they basically, you know, it was recorded as them slaughtering so many people and completely destroying the city. I mean, decimating it. They came up with all kinds of, you know, battering rams and stuff and just basically laid the city to rubble, to rubble. Then the people who, you know, fled, fled to the island. So you had the Phoenician people and the people who was there basically jump in their ships and go out to the island. A lot of people kept going, but the people who couldn't go anywhere else went to their home on the island. As you can see, it was, as I said, it was an island. So, you know, for the next seven months, Alexander and his troops went on killing and destroying, uh, killing people, enslaving people and destroying the city. But what they did was they used the rubble from the city to basically build a causeway from the mainland of Tyre to the island of Tyre. And in seven months, they had that causeway built. And in seven months, they went to that island and completely massacred about 30,000 people there. And the same situation occurred where some people bought their way out. Some people couldn't. The rest got enslaved or got killed. So he finally did end up taking that island and killing a bunch of people. 
so you can see it now how it looks the causeway is there but it wasn't there before and it is attributed to alexander this is something that everybody knows the romans have a monument there to this day can you know pertaining to alexander this is history people this is recorded history and it doesn't fit with the bible so it's funny how when we look at their book this is how this is how they try to hide you know away from it and say that oh well you know they, of course they're not going to say they wrote the book but this is how we can look at actual recorded history and see it doesn't fit with, with, with what the Bible is saying. But we can read the Bible and get the clues and see that this is where they stole their stories from uh, and put them in the Bible. But real history says something different. So, again, when we go to Ezekiel and understand, take note that this stuff is all in Ezekiel. When we talked about before about Satan and all that stuff in Ezekiel as well. So we read in Ezekiel 26, 3 through 6, it says, Therefore, thus say the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, which Tyrus is tired, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causeth his waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It should be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and it shall become a spoil of the nations, and her daughters which are in the field shall be slain by the sword, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So we know it's all bullshit, but this is how you prove that the Greeks are the ones who created the Bible. This is how you prove it. One, who else? Who else would know about this history? Now, I just talked to you, told you about the story about how Tyre was laid siege by um, Alexander. But then you read in the Bible and Ezekiel, them talking about, you know, the, the you know God, the Lord, basically sending nations against Tyre. Now, we know that it was nations that basically came up uh, against Tyre. I won't say many nations. You know, it was basically two, the Persians and the Greeks. So, you know, we know they came in, but who sent them you know what was this god you know from the bible destroying tyre or is it what we just read and we know i mean you could basically say yeah it, it's god because they are god plain and simple all they done is talking about what they did so we know that these people basically proclaim themselves as god that's what's hidden in the book they are the people who they are talking about when it's talking about the lord and god like i said it's no coincidence that we have the Lord in the Bible, and that's what English people call each other, lords, you know. So, no coincidence. These people know who they are, and they put themselves in the position as God in the Bible, and it's easy to break through that. So, you know, it's crazy. You know, the Greeks and the Romans have been calling each other gods, you know, proclaiming themselves to be gods for hundreds of years. So, when a black man say he God, he tripping. Oh, that nigga tripping, talk about something he God. The, the Greeks and freaking Romans been saying they got big statues and monuments to themselves, to the Caesars or what have you. As soon as we say it, we tripping. And these people stole everything they know from us. So understand, again, the whole metaphor of God goes back to them. And what they're doing is them proclaiming, you know, exactly what they did. It's all bullshit. It's all bogus. But this is how we can go in and see who wrote what so on the one hand you have the bible giving us the story of tyre but then you have actual recorded history talk about something completely different so it's going to get even more deeper we're going to decipher this thing real quick using the bible and actual history and it's easy because the thing is one a lot of people read this stuff and get confused but as i said when you know the bible and you know real recorded history it's easy to break down as I'm doing right here. But again, let's go to Ezekiel again. Ezekiel 26, 7 says, For thus say the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north, with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. There is no proof of a Nebuchadnezzar coming into Tyre and basically laying siege to the place. 
It's no proof. We're going to bust it up in a second to prove the point. So understand one, when I talked about before, when you hear about the uh, Philistines and the Hebrew Israelites, what have you, entire, it's all bullshit. They're trying to create this faulty timeline again to try to make it uh, an inconsistency in the rulership of Kemet. Because if they can do that in the rulership of Kemet and the Egyptian territory, then they can interject, you know, they people in history. Because remember, they got to fit themselves in history somehow, some way. They got to try to fit themselves in there. By them saying, well, the Egyptians didn't always rule this land, but they did. Because we know we can prove it. But they'll admit that the Egyptians did rule Phoenicia. But they say, well, I was off and on, off and on. But the Egyptians, being the cool people that they is, basically say, all right. We own this territory. We're basically teaching y'all anyway. Let's just use this land because the Egyptians was basically neutral because they work with everybody. Let's use this land so nobody won't feel cheated and let these people come in and use this land as a port. Again, you know, Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark and them talked about how much good the Egyptians did for everybody. Even when people go and look at the artifacts and the history of that land, they see it pertain to many people. But everybody, you know, it goes back to the Egyptians. So when they find a lot of the artifacts from, you know, the Phoenician times, you know, it goes back to many different uh, countries, different people, because the Egyptians let so many people win there. So, you know, all the Greeks had to do was take real history and distort it. You know, stuff that you can go back and kind of say, ah, maybe it's possible. Cast out, you know, conceal it, distort it. So they can kind of interject, you know, history in there. And this is exactly what they did. So it's saying that Nebuchadnezzar, God sent Nebuchadnezzar there to basically destroy the city. Now, bullshit. Prove it. Prove that Nebuchadnezzar came there and destroyed it. Can't prove that. Especially when we have already recorded history, proven history of Alexander destroying the place. So, again, Bible says one thing. Proven history says something else. Nobody can prove that he came in there. It's not possible. So the thing is this, and again, this is how you bust open history by understand or bust open a Bible by understanding history. Again, one, the only Nebuchadnezzar, because it's a bunch of them, the only Nebuchadnezzar that could have been close to the time uh, that this happened with the destruction of Tyre, the Tyrus, either one, uh, the only Nebuchadnezzar that could have been there during that time is Nebuchadnezzar II, but he died in the 6th century BCE which is long before the destruction of Tyre. So that's the only Nebuchadnezzar that can be even close to that time in actual history. So we know, no, it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. So again, this is how you touch the Bible. Now this is important and the way that we prove this is one, you go back to the Bible to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 26, 14, remember it says, and I will make thee like the top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more. This is the so-called prophecy of Ezekiel. Thou shalt be built no more. For I, the Lord, have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Now, the only time that Tyre was destroyed to where it was built no more begin with Alexander. And we talking about the fourth century BCE. Long after that Nebuchadnezzar that's close to this time frame, you know, had died already. So we're talking a fourth century BCE. So that's important because ever since Alexander destroyed the place, you had the Romans coming later and basically take it from the Greeks and they built on it. And then that got tore down by the by the uh Arabs. So this ruin that I showed you with the um, basically the temple of the obelisk or what have you is ruins. That whole area is a tourist attraction to this day. It's still in ruins. It's nothing built on there. You can see the remnants of Rome there, the remnants of Greece there, the remnants of the ancient Egyptians. But it has never been rebuilt, the city that was destroyed. So this is the so-called prophecy, which, again, it's one of those prophecies where it's bullshit. What's to stop anybody from going there? the government from going there right now and rebuilding the place. Now, one, it's a landmark, so they can't do it. So this is how you fulfill the prophecy. Oh, we're making a landmark, nobody can build there. But nothing ain't really stopping people from, from building, except for humans, men. This ain't God or no angels stopping people from building. It's permits, laws, legal shit that can be fixed by humans. So it's not a real prophecy. So understand, again, this is how you Fix, fix that whole thing. This is how you figure that whole thing out. We know one is not Nebuchadnezzar. 
because he wasn't allowed during that time. Two, the prophecy, its own prophecy in the Bible only fits around the time when Alexander in real history actually destroyed the place. So again, all the Greeks had to do, because remember, the King James Version was written between 1604 and 1611. So all they had to do was basically, they know the history, they know what happened, was put this in the book. They understand recorded history is already documented by many people. All they had to do was put it in the book, distort it, and make it as if, you know, it fits with biblical history because when you go back during that time, you can say, well, such a thing happened. I guess it's talking about them. No, this is actual history. So we know it's bullshit when it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar. Now, another one of the daggers that basically gives it away, we can find in the Bible. Again, talking about Alexander. The only person this fits is Alexander. So when you read again in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 26, 12 says, and they shall make a spoil you of thy riches and make a prey of thy merchandise, and they shall break down thy walls and destroy thy pleasant houses. As I said, Alexander destroyed the houses, and they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. Okay, so who did that? We know it's talking clearly about Alexander and about how he used, he tore down the cities. He took the rubble, he took the trees, took everything and built that causeway to get to the island. It's right there in the Bible. But does it talk about Alexander? No. It's trying to divert you away from actual history because if you follow actual history, it'll lead you to the truth, of course. But we can see what it's pertaining to. So again, you have them taking real history, distorting it, changing it, but leaving enough in there for you to figure out exactly who was talking to. And that's for the Masons. That's for the Masons. The Masons understand. You know, they can go in the book and understand, you know, what it's talking to, who it's pertaining to. That's for the historian as well. Because if you're a historian, you know, but wait a minute, damn. This this can't be. This is Alexander's story. It's clear as day. But you heard people before say, you know, Alexander uh, is in, you know, the Bible or what have you. Yeah, he's in there. But it's not talking about him in name specifically. But we can understand it's alluding to him to get people to break it down to understand what it's really talking about. So now remember in the Saturn of Satan series, we talked about... Alexander. We talked about their whole story. And, you know, we're going to get into that in a second. But remember, Tyre was basically being destroyed because the man proclaimed to be a god. So when you go to Ezekiel 28, as we talked about before, it is talking about the story of Satan. Remember, it's basically trying to couple Satan with this man. It's trying to give you this comparison. So he's addressing the king of Tyre. But he's talking about Satan. It's giving you this comparison in Ezekiel as well as in Isaiah. Remember, it said a man specifically. So remember, go back to the story of Alexander. We talked about how, you know, he is the only person, one, who fits this story. He is the only person you can look to that actually proclaimed to be a God who was a man that we know existed. So remember in the story of Alexander, you had... His mom, Alexander one proclaimed to be a god because his mom was basically seduced by Jupiter, which Jupiter would be the Roman equivalent of the Greek Zeus. So remember the depiction when you had uh, Olympias in the bed and Zeus on top of her with like the serpent lower half. And this is basically where, you know, he basically seduced Olympias and Alexander was born. And remember, Olympias tells Alexander on his way out to, to battle that, um, you know, he basically is the son of a God and he was walking around proclaiming to be the son of a God. So it's giving you that story so we can match that one what a man proclaiming to be the son of a God one with the story of Tyre and understand all of this is talking about the same thing in this in this passage. It's talking about Alexander. It's trying to give you the coupling. Not just that. You have the serpent aspect. You have the reptilian aspect. Of it, you have Zeus being coupled with the serpent, the reptilian, and this whole union going on is trying to tell you something. So when you put the story together, when you look at the entire story, one, it's not only giving you Alexander, it's trying to tell you who is responsible for basically beginning the rise of the European powers. It's pointing you straight to Alexander. So when you go back and look at the story, it's telling you one who Satan is. Because this is when people tell you, hey, these Europeans proclaim uh, are described as Satan in the Bible. This is what it's talking about. 
You have Tyre giving us Europa, giving us Europe, giving us the Europeans, giving us all of these things right here in this area, which this area just so happens to be where, you know, they basically laid claim, started the, the rise of the power, the European power, which right here. This is where Europe derives from. This is where the people begin or uh, they attest to the rise of their power right here. So at the same time, one, as again, I said, Satan has many aspects. This is one of his aspects. One of his aspects is black, is white as well. And it all goes into the whole duality thing. You know, it don't just go to uh, to white people, but to black people as well. But these people represent the negative part of Satan. So they put in all this stuff here to make you note something. So again, you know, Dr. Ben, John Henry Clark, you know, they talked about Alexander the Greek all the time. Alexander the Greek, Alexander the Greek. And that's something that always stuck with me. Remember, I, I said before, when I first went to Canada, when I was in the military, when I came back, like, you know, I was lost. Now, the woman did tell me in the uh, Cairo Museum, first time I went there, that I should know about Dr. Ben. You know, Dr. Ben, he get his books, whatever, you know. And luckily, I was able to get his books, and I started reading about Dr. Ben. Dr. Ben always talked about the Greeks, and he didn't really get into it, uh, you know, this way, as, as deep as this. But it was so much history that he gave about the Greeks. That's true history. Now, Dr. Ben will tell you, you're supposed to be reading the Bible. So I guess he figured, one, if you're reading your book, there's no way you're going to miss this. A lot of times, we just expect people to know the Bible when people don't know it. I be seriously, the way these Christians be coming at me, I be seriously expecting them to be experts. So when I'm saying stuff and pertaining to book, chapter, and verses, they be clueless, huh? And then I just get out the conversation. I'm like, no, you just emotional. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. But Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark stayed on Alexander the Greek for a long time to try to get people to trace him because there's so much history that pursues this man when you start following him. You get the whole breakdown, as I just pointed out, and it gets a lot more deeper. You start to, you know, peel away a lot of the layers and we can see the rise of this European power and see that proceeding all of this, we get Judaism, we get the Torah or the Septuagint, what have you, and we get the beginning of the religion being established. And as I talked about before, these people who they basically forced Judaism on was the slaves, was the leftover black people in those lands. So you gotta ask yourself, one, you know, how did Judaism start? Remember, I just talked about how Alexander and them basically enslaved all these people while they was there. They killed a lot of them, but enslaved a lot of the Africans, the, the Egyptians that was there. Again, the Egyptians was the first Jews. It's just that simple. These are the people they indoctrinated into the whole ideology because they tried to force Hellenization and the Greek customs on them, but you can't do that to no damn Egyptians because they know. Remember, it was the double cross. So when the Bible's talking about sinning Nebuchadnezzar in there to basically, uh, you know, kill off Tyre, it's kind of the same thing that happened. Remember I said before that Alexander and them, I believe, sent the Persians in there. Because they couldn't just go in there themselves. There was a double cross on the Persians as well. Remember, the Egyptians and the Greeks was living hand in hand. Romans as well, uh, at, uh, for a time. They was living together. Peace, harmony. The Egyptians helped them build so many of the, you know, the things that's in Greece. The Egyptians didn't deal with other people, gods, or what have you, and stuff like that. But they were respectful of other people's things and understood that, you know, Greek mythology is basically Egyptian mythology. And they had their own little spin on it. They understood because they taught them how to do the shit. So they lived together peacefully. Everything was cool. So you can't have the Greek government basically say we're going to turn on these people because the people wouldn't be for it. The people was cool with the Egyptians, probably likely in a marry in some cases with some of the people. Everything was fine. So what do you do? You give the Persians the key to the back door and say, go in there and take that shit. Knowing that you can beat the Persians later on, knowing the weakness, knowing if they get it to certain points, you know how to get in there. But if the Persians take over, then you can say, oh, well, we're going in there and basically helping out our, our brothers, the Egyptians. Remember, they only came to help the Egyptians one time. And I forget that story on one part of land, but they was defeated. 
uh, some of the, the Greeks came to help the Egyptians out in some part of, I believe it was near Ionia somewhere, but they was defeated and they fled. But the Greeks didn't come in full force to the aid of the Egyptians. Nobody did because people wanted to see them fail. You know, it's like being cool with somebody, with, a, with somebody who owned the mansion on the block, the biggest, best house on the block. They still looking out for y'all. But it's so much more in their house. And eventually people get together and say, you know, I can't wait till their house fall. Because as soon as it falls, I'm going to run in there and get what I can get. People not being grateful. People who have a material mindset. Not thinking about, you know, the spiritual aspect of what the Egyptians was trying to do for them. But you had the, um, you had the Greeks basically fall to the Romans. Eventually. But before all that, you had the Greeks basically... You know, enslaved these black people, they created Judaism and they pushed it on the people and got them to basically indoctrinate their own people with Judaism and they eventually spread it over to after time, you know, went by and they got people on board, they spread the religion. Because again, you know, the whole thing with LXX, the letters of Orestes, goes against the actual history of the Greeks. There's no way that Ptolemy the second Philadelphus actually, you know, pay the, the Jews all this money to come and do this translation and freed a bunch of the Jewish slaves. It don't fit. It don't make sense. Why? Because of Hellenization. We understand that Hellenization was going on for a long time. That Hellenization was them afflicting the Serapis, which I showed you in the video when I went to uh to the Cairo Museum, Serapis, the actual statue, them, you know, forcing the rapists and forcing these Greek gods on the people. This is what it was. They was forcing the um, the uh, the Greek ideology or what have you, trying to force it on the people. So one of the things we have to understand, one, is if the Jews was just this separate people, separate, you know, away from the Greeks, why would the Greeks be trying to push Hellenization on them knowing that once you set these people free, they got their own religion or what have you, and you trying to push Hellenization because they did push it in Israel. But again, the people weren't going for that shit. They wasn't going for no Hellenization. They knew what it was. So they came up with Judaism. They came up with it. Now they, they trying to make it like, oh, well, this happened between us and the Jews so they can establish a faulty timeline by saying that Judaism was already established before this. Bullshit. It didn't happen until after that. So when y'all was trying to push, which is recorded, when y'all was trying to push Hellenization in that area, there was no Judaism yet. Y'all was still developing it, working on it. And then since the people didn't fall for the shit and fall for Serapis and fall for all they bullshit, they came out with Judaism, pushed it. You know, you have uh, uh, generational knowledge is what happened. So that generation passed. And remember, these people don't care about time. So they can be working towards one agenda and die trying to fulfill that agenda. But once the time passed and the kids now got indoctrinated into it and they just grew up with Judaism and grew up with it and it just became, it stuck. Because all the people who knew the truth was dead and gone. And then you had people with no knowledge, wasn't passed down, and they got born into this whole Judaism and it just spread. And this is how they basically spread Judaism. So you have Ezekiel giving us this story coupling, you know, Satan with this man, with the so-called King of Tyre or what have you. So again, you look at this story again, and as, as I started out with, and you will ask yourself, well, why isn't the story about Satan in the beginning of the book? Why is it not in Genesis? That gets you thinking about Genesis. So you go to Genesis and you think about one, the story is talking about a person pretending to be a God or acting like a God. Remember, it's not 100% definitively, definitively clear on what's going on here. It's the dude possessed by Satan. It's, what, it's what, one of the most debated books in the Bible. Again, we're going to get into that, all this stuff and more when we get into the whole series on the Bible, which is going to be coming up soon. But it's debated because you got to really think about it. Why? Okay, well, give me the story. Give me the story. What's going on? What happened? Because if this, if this was actual history and stuff that, that happened, you can give us uh, a biblical account of what really happened up in heaven. Why did Satan rebel? What was going on? We know it talks about what it talks about, but go into detail the way you do with, build, with the building of Noah's Ark 
as far as what the hell happened up there. You know, what happened? But it doesn't really give us that. Instead, we get this. We get what's in Ezekiel. We get what's in Isaiah. We get distorted stuff in Revelations. It's not definitively clear. And a couple in Satan with a man and kind of confusing you as to what's going on here. So when you go back to Genesis and it's talking about, you know, Adam and Eve and the serpent story, what have you. And you have to look at it and say, well, damn, it's almost the same as in Ezekiel. Because understand what whatever created us, whatever it was, it's not God. That's what we would think of God. Whatever created us is not the same being that created the universe, all the other planets, the stars, or what have you. Plain and simple, it is not. So when you read in Genesis 1, 26, when it says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, what is it talking about? Again, this goes back to consciousness. It goes back to consciousness. It goes back to consciousness and existence itself. So making man in our likeness, you know, there is no visible image of consciousness. There is no visible image of existence as, except for existence, something that exists. So the fact that we exist and have a consciousness, we would be in the likeness of the creator, which would be consciousness, existence. So basically, as I said before, you had consciousness and existence create a physical form, which would be not just us, everything that we see out in the universe. So let us make man in our image after our likeness. The image and likeness of the creator would be what? You know, what we are. You know, we, we are that. We are the result of consciousness creating energy, creating the elements, creating matter. That's what we are. So when you go, again, when you go to the creation of Adam, talking about the atoms, those are the elements. Creating man from the dust of the ground. The ground, the earth, stardust, that's all it is. That's what we are. We are stardust. We are made up of stardust. It's just that simple. Everything started with stardust. <laughs> Big chunks dust, from dust to clumps to big boulders to what have you. You go from planets, you go from grass and everything what have you to us. These are all elements and energy and all this stuff coming from one conscious source. It's not no being that created this body. Again, this body was created. And then when you go back to the story in Genesis, it's telling you that. Remember, let us form man. Make man, I'm gonna mold this man like canoe, molding man on a potter's will. God didn't create this spirit, this energy, this soul, they create that. So when Satan goes to the garden and he says to Eve, Hey, bullshit, you ain't gonna die if you eat off this tree. He know you ain't gonna die because he understood that they were gods lacking knowledge. You, you a god, you just like this dude, you just don't have the knowledge, you don't have the understanding of knowing what you are. Know thyself, you know, going back to Egyptian parable. You just don't know who you is. Why does Satan know? Because he went through the same shit. If he, when you get into the whole parable of the story, God created him. Why don't you just kill Satan off him? Get rid of him. You can't because he's just like you. He is you. So understand what it's trying to say here is the creator, whoever it is, is just like us. Made from what? Stardust. It's not the hundred the real you know supreme consciousness of the universe it's just whatever these beings are that created us they are made from the same thing as we are they have more knowledge than we do they have a different composition than we do they have more knowledge they can do more things they are you know well well more experienced in this universe than us but they are not the creator of the entire universe. So when you're tracing all this back to the powers that be, when you're tracing all this back to Ezekiel, when you're tracing this back to, you know, what we talked about as far as these people proclaiming themselves to be God, it's basically telling you exactly the same thing. 
that these people are proclaiming to be God, claiming to have all this power. They may know more than you do, but in, you know, in essence, for real, for real, they just like you. They are not all powerful beings. They are not the gods, the creators. It may seem that way because they trick you to believe they are. So now remember, we talked about the purple dot. We talked about the purple dot of the Marax and uh, the purple dot that basically gives uh, Phoenicia its names. Uh, it's named from the uh, Greeks who called it Phoenician, from the Greek word uh, Phoenicus, and that purple dye. Now, purple dye, again, everything that we've been seeing so far, you can go in the Bible and you can find purple dye as well. So when you look in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 27.7 says, Fine linen, we brought work from Egypt, was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy sail. Blue and purple from the isles of Elisha, was that which covered thee. So this is Elisha. Elisha is basically in ancient Ionia. Now Elisha is a man. Elisha is the son of Jovan. Jovan goes back to Japheth. Japheth, remember, goes back to Greek mythology to Iapetus, who was a titan. Remember, Iapetus is one of the moons of Saturn. It's the moon that looks like the Death Star. So you have all of this Greek mythology, everything pointing you into the direction of the Greeks, one, but also in the direction of Satan, Saturn, Satan. They're giving you everything right here all in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is really important to understand when you start going through the verses and seeing what all this stuff pertains to. We only scrape the surface. We only gonna be able to scrape the surface in this video. It's so much more, but we will eventually get into all of it as we go along. But it's giving you so much, you know. So we understand one. What is the purple dye about? We understand this goes back to the colors of royalty. The purple, the purple and scarlet. We know about that. So the purple goes back to royalty. There was never a king of Tyre. The Egyptians didn't do that whole king thing. The only person who would even be crowned king in Tyre would be Alexander. He's the only one that will be crowned king. So they're giving you the clues here. What did they do? We, we, we're talking about one, this is the birthplace of Europe. The Europeans are the one who started this whole king shit. Kings, kings, kings. They talk about kings, one, you know, everybody was kings, this and that. And the thing is, the timeline is out of whack. Because you would think all these territories that existed during the time of Kemet, around the time a lot of these people was king. They had no concept of it. It was just about conquest, conquest. The whole king things was them understanding how a structure, a governmental structure was set up. We had that in Africa, not just in Kemet. So they got it from us. But this is how they began their kingship, the European powers. Purple was their color. We understand about purple and scarlet. You know, in the Bible, we know the Vatican. That's their colors. They wear purple and scarlet. So they're trying to basically mark, as I said before, the beginning of their reign. So you had the siege of Tyre and the siege of Israel, which is one of the reasons why Israel is the Holy Land, because you have all you have the religions come together there, which are the religions that's leading everything right now. But you got to understand. Look it up. 332 B.C. 332 BC, they actually conquered Israel and Tyre at the same time. The same time. These are the holy lands to them. This is the places they still rule to this day that they cloak. It's all still ruled by Rome. Rome never lost power. Whatever they tell you is bullshit. They are still in power and have been still in power. Again, the papacy. I mean, they point you right in, into their direction. Again, we know purple and scarlet. We know Revelation is talking about the, the uh, woman dressed in purple and scarlet, you know, when she had uh, jewels and everything in her body, just comparing her to the same thing they said to Satan. This is why the Geneva Bible called the Pope the Antichrist. Adorned in jewels and, you know, pearls and everything, just like they describe Satan, they describe the whore of Babylon or the so-called, you know, scarlet witch and everything you want to call her. Same shit. Pointing you right in that direction, giving you everything right in Ezekiel. You just got to look. When you start reading, there's no way you can get around it. Everything we've been talking about is going back to Europe. It's pertaining to the powers that be, pertaining to the European powers, and they rise. They lay siege to Israel. They, they lay siege to Tyre. They had to get into these lands first in order to 
you know, really began a conquest. And this was what really started it for them. And it's pointing you right in this direction and giving you everything. So now remember, Nebuchadnezzar, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, remember, it's giving you his dream. Remember, Daniel was supposed to interpret his dream. He had these dreams and he tried to get the magicians and everybody to come and interpret it. They couldn't do it. So he was like killing them off or what have you. And then, you know, he was like, Daniel, you're supposed to have favor with God or what have you. You come in and interpret these dreams for me. And he came and he basically, you know, told him about the dreams. Remember the dreams. Think about it. Somebody had just exploded right now. <laughs> what were the dreams about? The four nations. The four nations. Remember gold, and iron, I mean the brass and the iron or what have you, dirt. What, what, what were those four nations? Here they go. Here they go. Now Babylon, we can skip Babylon. Babylon, what should be there, should be Egypt. But this is how they try to hide and distort it, put Babylon there. But you have Babylon, which should be Egypt. You have Persia. You have the Greeks. You have the Romans. You have the Romans again. What is we talking about here? Remember, we go back to Ezekiel 26, 7, I believe it was, when he basically said, I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar to lay siege to where? Tyre. Didn't he send Nebuchadnezzar? Look at what Nebuchadnezzar is. You understand what I'm saying? You get it now. So those, when you look at the bus, notice how it's in the shape of a man. But that man is supposed to be Nebuchadnezzar. And you have the colors, the, the stones, the gold, or what have you. But... You have this man representing the, the exact, the, the nations that actually went in there and basically laid siege to Tyre. So when he said in this video that I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar, he really did send Nebuchadnezzar. This is the hint it's giving. Again, it's one of those daggers, you know, to the Bible when not only do they hide. the See how they hit it really well? They hit it really good. Not only do they give you the story but you have to look deeper and this is what we're going to go through as we go you know into bible more and more so when you look deeper the answer is right there they give it to you this is why i say to people it's in codes it's hidden it's in riddles you got to know where to look if you read the book and you know history you're going to be able to figure stuff out there it is right there for you people he said, I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar. All right. Just so happened that Daniel Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And his dream was the real nations that actually laid siege to Tyre. That's what he's talking about when you break it down. So he gave it to us. So it was kind of sort of Nebuchadnezzar. You know, but again, we know it wasn't no actual Nebuchadnezzar because he definitely, according uh, uh, to his the date they gave for his life and death, he wasn't even alive around that time. They could have distorted the date. Why didn't they? They could have changed it. These people control stuff. They didn't. They have to leave this stuff out here. There's rules, as I told you. This stuff is right here in front of our face, but people choose not to see it. Now, the important part about that prophecy in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's prophecy, is the end. We know what it's talking about. Remember, what's supposed to happen? God is supposed to basically come and basically scatter all the nations and basically consume them, you know, into one that's supposed to be ruled by God. But who is God? They are. So when I try to tell people, it ain't no damn Bible prophecy coming true. It's men fulfilling what they wrote. And at the end, when all this stuff supposed to come to pass and Jesus, everybody looking for Jesus to come back or God to come down. Hey, I, he was here the whole time. You ain't get the Bible. You ain't understand what he was talking about. Oh, that's your fault. It's, it's us. It's we. Now we're in control. We have everything. And when they do this, people, this is what I'm trying to tell people. This is why I try to prepare y'all for the next step. You know, fifth dimension, whatever you want to call it, the afterlife, whatever you want to say. Because looking at this world and the way these people is, the way that people are just so consumed with greed and materialism and just so lost, they're going to win. They're going to win. And I really believe that. Some of you watching is not going to be stuck here when they do. You're going to make it. You spend time. You sit here. You made it to this point in the video. You've been watching. You are serious about what you're doing. Not everybody is. Everybody thinks it's a joke. They don't care. They worry about the next party. They worry about the next episode or something. They're not serious because they think all this stuff is bullshit. Unfortunately, I can't 
put all this, just put it out on YouTube. One, they'll take it down. Two, it's just going to get subject to scrutiny. This is, this is work right here, people. This is work. This is knowledge. And it's tough. One, I got to go back into my old notes and research because I wrote all this stuff out years ago. I got to put this stuff together and try to put together a reasonable presentation for you guys to understand and give to you, you know. It's not easy as it as it looks. So I write notes, you know, so I can remember, so I can try to, you know, I have to be uh 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 have a really good memory. Because when 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 something is so serious, it sticks with you. But also when you're excited about something, you get a little bit out of focus because you're so excited to speak about it. So sometimes you know I jump on my words or you know I'm not as clear as I should be because I'm sitting in front of a camera. There is no cameraman here. Maybe a couple times there was people here, you know, when I recorded a couple times, but rarely it's just me in front of the camera. This is this is my heart that I'm giving. You. This is what I want you to understand. This is my life's work. And it took me a long time to accumulate this knowledge. And um, unfortunately, some people are not going to appreciate it. They're not going to get it. When you connect something so serious as the Bible to actual you know history in so many different ways i mean it's over it's game you can see what happened now for me it was a eureka moment it was okay i know you know this was one of the moments when it was like game when it was like damn i ain't gotta be like you know thinking like damn am i tripping is it really a jesus da, da, da. you know when when you get the, all that knowledge all that shit goes out the door and you know definitively 100% without a doubt, the man didn't exist. As I said before, it's possible there was a Jesus. I don't think his name was Jesus or somebody who they're talking about who fit that description, but he wasn't the son of God and all that extra shit and walk on water and all that bullshit. That stuff ain't true. It might have been some dude who had this knowledge and was walking around trying to preach it and they crucified his ass and they just made a story about it because it's the type of shit they do. But it wasn't no Lord and Savior die for your sins and all it just it wasn't happening. Man, we'll get to this down the line. There are stories, but they it's not about no, nobody named Jesus. It's about a couple people. But you do hear stories about, you know, remember I talked about how these people was Africans, about how some of these people had this knowledge and tried to teach it in secret to the Africans. And, you know, they was caught and crucified. This is what they was doing back then. When you got caught with that real knowledge, they crucified your ass. This is what they was doing. And it's probably what it happened. But when you come into this knowledge and you get it and you understand what's going on, it, just, it changes everything. It changes your outlook on everything else. Hopefully it does. You still got to live life. You still got to go to work. You still got to do what you got to do. Pay bills. You still got to survive. Do what you got to do. But don't deprive yourself of knowledge. Seriously. It's everything. It's everything. It's what's going to allow you to, to go. And not be stuck here because these motherfuckers is going to win because people are stupid. They don't give a shit. They don't care about nothing but themselves. They lost and they, and they delight in, their, in them being lost. But they, they love it. So unfortunately, because a lot of people are ignorant and don't care about the people, good people are going to have to suffer. Don't be one of those fucking people. Get this stuff. Get it on your own. Get it from me. Get it from somebody else. I don't care how you do it. Get it. Get it. Know it. Get it in you. Because it's everything. Meditation too. You know, this stuff going to come in. It's going to start changing your dreams, changing your outlook on a lot of stuff. Because you bring it in this knowledge. You need to get this stuff. Okay, so boom. Nebuchadnezzar is basically telling you exactly who really lay siege to Tyre. Same people that lay siege to Kemet. Same people, you know, you know, Persians, Greeks eventually the Romans and it's telling you everything right there and the crazy part is it's saying that you know the last prophecy about how everything is going to be destroyed or what have you and it's funny how Islam is left out this is why a lot of people say because we know Islam came in but you know when they when they came out with this he could have changed it in the, in the uh, King James Version and put it there so it pertains to Islam in some way but this destruction that's supposed to happen, a lot of people will tell you that it's going to be because, you know, of Islam. So something to look out for and just think about. But think about it. 
you know, once these people got control of this land, now they have control of Israel. They have control of Phoenician land. They can do whatever they want. They can say whatever they want. They can write stuff into existence. But we know it's bullshit. But this is how they can come up with the whole, uh, you know, Ptolemy II of Philadelphia and uh, Septuagint and everything by saying, you know, you know, came from these people. Everything is going back to the Greeks because then the Greeks can control the story. Goes to Israel because then they can control the story. But we know it's all bullshit. So one of the things is you have the language. You have the writing. Because when you when you find something that's Hebrew, they always say, oh, well, no, uh, this is Paleo-Hebrew. Because they'll tell you that, you know, Hebrew comes from Phoenician. So you have Phoenician, you have, you know, Proto-Hebrew or Paleo-Hebrew, and you have, you know, Hebrew. But they can use it because they know, well, we, we got control of the Phoenician land. When you look up the Greek language, guess what? They say, oh, we got it from the Phoenicians. We got it from the Phoenicians. So, you know, when you read here, the history of the Greek alphabet starts with the adoption of Phoenician letter forms and continues to the present day. Enough said, but let's go to the Phoenician alphabet. It says down here, skip all that, the Phoenician alphabet is derived from Egyptian hieroglyphics. Plain and simple, because that's where it all came from. So when people tell you the Egyptians had the first writing, all this stuff came from there. These people didn't know squat. Plain and simple, they got taught. It comes from Kemen. So you have to think, as I said, this was a land where so many different people came into. So... You can't learn all those languages, but you got to deal with these people. So the Egyptians developed this language, which, you know, you can say is the Phoenician language. They developed the language for everybody to learn one language. If we all learn this one language, you know, then this is what we can use to basically conduct business or what have you. This is what a lot of people believe the Phoenician language was because we know this was Egyptian territory, but we know the language was kind of separate from the ancient Egyptian language. But we know these people was Egyptians. But you can see, they tell you clear as day, that's where it came from. That way you can hide it. But when these people find these artifacts or what have you, they can say, oh, well, you know, uh, it's proto, you know, proto or Phoenician, Phoenician or what have you. Notice they always say that for every uh, uh, artifact they find that supposed to pertain to the Hebrews or Israel. It's bullshit. They can't, they can't prove it. So they got to piggyback. You know, this this is just a, a drumming of history in this video. If you understand what I'm saying, you might have to watch this twice. But if you dig in this information, it kills everything. It just crushes the Bible, crushes the whole Hebrew bullshit. Everything. Everything is right here. All this stuff can be researched and fact checked. You can go look at the books I put up and see what's going on. But this is it. This is it. This is a big smash right here. It's a big piece of the puzzle right here. When you start to understand what exactly we're talking about in this video. So a lot of the um, the artifacts they do find, one, because as I said before, if anybody, if you're reading anything that's talking about these Hebrews or the Israelites existing before the 4th century BCE, you know it's bullshit. Because they didn't exist before the Greeks took that land, before they took Egypt, before they took Tyre, before they took Israel didn't exist. So we know that happened in the fourth century, you know, 300s BCE. So before that, they didn't exist. There's nothing you can find. That's why we can't find no bodies. We can't find no artifacts. You don't start getting their history until after that, when you start actually finding stuff. So you got these Hebrews talking about 1000 AD and 200 AD. I know that's long ago. It doesn't fit still. It's still not before fourth century BC. Find me something before 4th century BCE, which they do have. But it's not proven 100% to be real because we know it's not real. They could put a date on all this stuff and give you these little shards and little pieces of stuff and say it's uh, Hebrew or it's the Israelites. It's always a little shard. It's always a piece. They never can prove it. When you read the whole story, you have a bunch of other scholars and researchers that doubt the dates. It's all bogus. It's all bogus. Based upon proven history. So it's when you know history and you know this book, there's no debating it. We got it. So now ain't it good to know the truth, people? It feel good to know. We got another piece. It's good to know the truth, to know what's going on, to know where some of the stuff starts to fit. 
So understand where it fits. And then again, when you start getting into this stuff again, you can see what is truth, what is fiction. And you have a more broader understanding of what to look for. As I said again, you know, if they give you anything before the fourth century, it's bogus. You're just not going to find nothing. It's just not going to be real. It's not going to be real at all. So you understand they, they latch on to history. And you understand, one, when we're looking at all this stuff, it's all pertaining to the Greeks, the Romans. It's pertaining to these people, the whole Greco-Roman thing. Remember, you saw a little, you probably didn't see the clip if you don't follow me on Instagram, but we know that they followed us. And I showed you in the Cairo Museum, you know, that they have all the artifacts, they have all the proof to show exactly what they did. They put it in the Cairo Museum that they followed us. You know, take a quick look. Look at this wannabe pharaoh right here. It's hot. They got to keep it a certain temperature in here. But look at the face, clearly. This is the Greco-Roman era. You see how they try to decree themselves like us. Make Stella. See, it's all in Greek. Bullshit. All here. This is from the Greco-Roman era. Greco-Roman, when they came into Kemet and tried to basically, you know, be like us. Still our shit. You see they statues here, they're putting their own little section. They actually came into Kemet and carved themselves into a lot of the walls. Here is the actual statue of Serapis Christos right here. You can see him. Serapis. You can see when they had the Zeus, Amon. So you can see where the stuff came from. Zeus, Amon. Everything that we tell you about this stuff, it's all here. It's no bullshit. It's here telling you the truth about how they stole from Kemet. So then there's a lot more history to all this. You look at the Etruscan uh, Romans. Supposed to be black people. We understand that even still, while this stuff was going on with the with, uh, in Greece and you know, remember Black Athena and everything like that. The whole ancient ancient Greeks was black. That land was full of black people. And remember when I talked about in Buddhism, the rise of the Aryan power. Remember the Aryans started coming down. They ain't just hit over in the Indus Valley in India, what have you. Yeah, they hit us in Europe as well because we was there. And Again, it's so, it's so much history that's covered up. So much that we're going to get into this stuff as much as we get. We're going to get into it as much as we can, as much as I can show you. But, of course, you had these people in Europe, Italy as well, which you have so many things that's showing you ancient uh, people in Italy were, were African people, were black people. Get into debates with people and people want to just try to make up names and call people all kinds of different stuff. Black is black. That's, they don't care if you black, you black. So if they focused on all of us in this same way, you got to understand there's something about us. And as I said before, the difference between us in America and people that's in Africa is exactly that. The people that got put on those slave ships had knowledge. They had knowledge. They wanted to get them out of Africa, away from the rest of the population, because these were the people who could actually develop the continent. You got to get them out of there. If you leave any of these people there who are kings and moors and you don't get them on your side, you got to off them or enslave them. Because if they talk to the rest of these people and start to understand that it's a plan in place that's going to put all these European, these white people against these Africans, then they smart. They're going to devise a plan and bring the whole continent together. And that's going to be game. Imagine that. So to stop all that, we were enslaved. And that's, and that's just the people that was had the knowledge in Africa, not to mention the rest of us, the rest of the Africans that was already in Americas, that was already in those lands. So, and they was intelligent as well. Whole different story. Whole different story. So, we know, again, you had Africans in Rome, you had so many different civilizations of African people around the world with this knowledge. And they came in and slowly got in and slowly took over. It's just no way around all that. It's exactly what everything is showing us. So a lot of people, you know, just don't understand history. They don't want to look around and see what's going on. The Romans play a big part in the whole thing. And 
It's one of the things you got to look at it. And we'll get into this down the line because you got to understand one, you know, what is that difference? Why it seemed like at some point the Greeks and the Romans who are, you know, both white people, why were they separated? Why, why, why did it make more sense for them to have been together from the start? And we got to understand that that may be a distortion in history, which we'll get into down the line. Because you got to remember, once the Romans took over, they continued Hellenization. Why is it that the Romans had all these same deities that pertain to the Greeks? Oh, it's the, uh, I just talked about before, with Zeus and Jupiter. With Jupiter supposed to be the Roman equivalent of Zeus. Why? Why we found all these Roman gods equivalent of Greek gods? What's up with that? So we're going to get into all that as we get into this series more and more. And, uh, you know, you guys can understand what's actually taking place. But, um, you know, you start to see this stuff start to come over into you know, Judaism, Christianity, and it still was a lot going on around this time when you understand how the stuff spread. So we got to remember people, you know, history is everything. If we don't learn history, we are not going to understand what's going on today. Now you got a big chunk of history and you can understand where this stuff started, how these people got in and began their dynasties, begin their rule, their control. This is where it started at. It started with Alexander. It started with them first taking the Greek land and the Roman land is very scarce history about all that. A lot of stuff was destroyed and covered up. So we don't have much history. We only have bits and pieces. But we know for sure, based upon artifacts and accounts, those lands was full of Africans. But you can begin to see what took place and how these people crept in and uh, took control. And the thing about all this stuff is the Bible is decipherable. Just like how I was piecing it together to you now, you can sit down. Piece this stuff together and prove the validity of the planet belonging to African people or African people being here before anybody else. It's easy to prove. You can break it down and show the world what these people did, just like how I just did. You can break it down and show this is where the stuff come from because there's no denying it. And they don't have any history to back it up. But we have the proof. We have the proof to prove who we are. We have the Egyptians. There's proof. Tire, there's proof. You know, they have the structure still there, the ruins still there. We have the proof. So this is why they distort the information. They don't want us to understand it because if we got a platform, imagine, let's just imagine if Obama was the real deal black dude and knew what I know, how he could just, not even Obama, he could just have it done. If TV series or the news media began to explain this stuff and break it down, that's the end of everything. This is why I tell people knowledge can change the world. We can change the world. Knowledge is the key. Because we know what happened. This is why none of these these races, none of these white people can stand an argument with me. I kill them every time because I know history. And I can break it down and give them the facts and proof to destroy the ideology. It's ideology. <laughs> it's crazy. So when you know it, it's easy when you can just start going and say, oh, no, this is what happened. And you have the proof to back it up and you can show people. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. And this is what people need to understand. Real, true history, right history and what's going on. But again, a lot of these people are, you know, they're religious and they don't care. They don't want the truth. But that doesn't mean that the truth is not the truth and that it's, it's invalid somehow because somebody won't accept it. It's still the truth. Rational people will listen. And you get enough rational people on board, that's all you need. That's all you need. Stuff can get done. So the stuff is hitting because they don't want us to understand uh, true history, you know, and how they stole our shit, you know, basically, because it's right there in the Bible. Anybody with any kind of brain can figure this stuff out if you want to. They're talking about us, plain and simple in the book, but it's not the truth. And that's the problem. As I said, the Israelites are right on top of it. They close. They write in a lot of aspects, but they think the shit is real. That's their problem. Damn, y'all got it. Y'all right. They are fake Jews. You're right about that. The book's talking about us. You're right about that. But the stories is not true. I mean, I understand how some of these people can be so smart, yet so stupid. They be knowing the Bible. They seem so intelligent, but they be so off because they don't want to look outside the book. And the book dooms them. It dooms them. And they never going to get it. They're going to die. So many people have died believing in this book. It's crazy. But the truth is out there. You got to want it. You got to want to do the research. You got to want to read. And that's the problem. A lot of people who don't want to read, they hate to read. You got to read. I don't care how boring it is. You know, get into it. Psych yourself up. You know, it's, it's something you have to do if you want to know this stuff. I get excited. 
learning new stuff. I get excited, you know, uh, getting back into some of this information, going back through my notes, you know. And um, there's a lot of stuff that we got to get into. But, um, yeah, I want to thank you guys for supporting, you know. I put out a lot of DVDs because it's a lot of information. I put out a lot of videos. A lot of people say, damn, you know, you got a lot of DVDs out. You know, 20, this will make about 24, I think, by my count. And then more to come because it's a lot of information. It's just stuff that, you know, it's good to have this stuff on DVD or have it saved on your computer or what have you. Because I honestly believe YouTube going to be gone eventually. This knowledge is going to be gone. You know, it's good to have the downloads. It's good to have the DVDs and have a archive of this stuff. I have all my videos backed up and hidden in all kinds of places. And, you know, just in case. <laughs> but um, it's good information to have. And eventually, as I get time, I'm going to put as much as I can in books, of course. As much as I can. All this stuff is going to come out. Everything is going to, you know, be definitely out soon. And I appreciate everybody's support and patience uh, and people believing in what I'm trying to do. So, you know, the support is real. It's, it's awesome. Everybody on Instagram, you know, the messages I be getting, Facebook, everybody who emailed me, you know. So people just cool. People from all over the world, people just cool. Don't speak English, Google Translate. Uh, don't write English, I should say that they understand it. Uh, but they Google Translate me a lot of stuff. And I'd be like, what the hell are you trying to say? Because the Google Translate be off. But um, cool people out there, man. Y'all know who y'all is. The people who I really talk to. Uh, but yeah, appreciate the support. Yeah, a lot more to come. A lot more to come on YouTube. I've been trying to you know, bombard YouTube with a lot of stuff. A lot of people ask for the previews. Can you do more previews of the videos? A lot of people was asking for that. That's why I started putting them up there. Because, you know, I guess people, they, they don't trust that, you know. I got, you know, I got the shit, I got skills, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so they want to see, I guess, if the video is worth buying. So, you know, put the previews up there so people would kind of see uh, what we talk about. But, um, you know, I appreciate everybody who, who, you know, sort of kind of keep the faith in what I put out. You know, not everything I put out you might not understand at that moment is, boom, you know, spot on information. Uh, but... If you, when you go back and watch stuff, you'll understand what I'm saying. Which is why I try to tell people to keep, um, try to keep up with the videos because a lot of this stuff is almost like continuations, and I kind of sort of go into old stuff a lot to prove my point. So if you have like all the videos or what have you, you, you understand this stuff is coming a lot more clearer. But um, you know, I do this from time to time. But you know, as I said, you know, I'm actually late for dinner. <laughs> I wanted to get this out because we're running around. It's the weekend. But um, thank you guys for taking the time to watch. Appreciate the support. See you guys next video.